I'm going to give you two for each act of Joel. It's practices that you can practice every day and it will shift you or oscillate you out of ministry to to ministry with. It will take you out of the dominant position which we have to admit our egos like that position. We get stroked all the time if we are in that dominant position. We like that. It's never good though. It's never good. And so, if we take the first act of Joel, which basically says, recognize the damage the locusts have caused. That's the first act of Joel. Recognize the damage the locusts have caused. Two practices come to mind. And the first one is just awareness. To be always aware that the person you are talking with is probably intimately familiar with loss and grief. And the likelihood that that person has processed that loss and grief is minimal at best. My mom is 89. My dad died five years ago. So on this visit, I asked my mom, has any of the pastors come and just sat with you and said, Tani Maria, where are you with this death that happened after 50-something years of marriage? Where are you? Not a single person. Not an elder, not a deacon, not a pastor. Nobody has come to her to ask that question. If you work alongside young persons, if you happen to meet a young person, be aware that loss and trauma is part of their life script. It's written into their lives. What can we do about that? It's not that I can fix you. It's not that I can even change what happened. Of course we can do that. But what we can do is, by facilitating a conversation around loss, persons begin to find a new identity. Remember I said, you cannot be the same person after a loss occurred which means you are confused. You have to find a new identity to live into. You find that by telling stories. That's how you find it. So awareness is just really, really key. The likelihood that you will practice awareness is diminished if you haven't faced your own losses and traumas and griefs. Research shows that people like us, pastoral leaders, actually carry a higher percentage of loss and trauma than the average population out there. Many of us got this compliment that you were so mature for your age. And our parents truly offered that to us as a compliment when it is probably one of the saddest things a kid can hear. Health is being six at the age of six. That's health. Health is not being eight years old, but now you live like a 12-year-old. That's not health. Almost all of us in this room, I would guess, were mature for our age kids. That's the kind of person that God somehow calls into ministry. One day we should ask why. <laughs> so, if you and I want to practice awareness, you and I have to begin with ourselves. How close can you come to your own losses and your own griefs. If you serve a declining congregation, 
the loss that you personally have is pronounced. If you serve a congregation that has a lot of elderly folk in and the act you do the most is to bury people, you know profound loss. If you live in a rural area, rural areas know profound loss because the youth go away never to return. That's all they know is loss. Be aware. And as I've said, lament, according to Joel, is the gift that Scripture gives us to, to redefine ourselves anew. Uh, in the millennial narrative, I give examples, some of my own laments, some other laments, but I take people on a journey on how to write a lament, which you need to do. Empathy is the second practice. Empathy, the second practice. Kara Powell and her colleagues, uh, they teach at the Youth Institute at Fuller Theological Seminary. Culturally, probably closer to some of the mainline churches represented here, okay? And one of the things that they have found in their research is that you have to find a way to ask those three questions, which are the questions millennials struggle with. Who am I? Where do I fit in? Where do I make a difference? Powell and her colleagues found that those are the questions that young people wrestle with. So you can find a way through empathy to ask that question. So you are 16 years of age. Tell me who you are and who you want to be one day. Just ask the question, which is the reverse of the struggle that they're having. Empathy, however, requires that you can put yourself into the shoes of someone else. It's an amazing capacity that is limited to your capacity to imagine. If you have a limited capacity to imagine, you cannot really be empathic. Can I imagine myself as somebody who grew up conservative Catholic in Puerto Rico, this island, and I am now a transgendered person, and everybody shuns me because of that. Can I imagine what's that like? You can only do that if your imagination is well developed. So you and I read poetry, we read no novels, we listen to music, we expose ourselves to the imagination of others who are way more developed than ours in terms of imaginative capacities so that our imagination can grow as well. I wonder, most Americans today, can they imagine themselves what does it mean to be an immigrant with no papers in the U.S.? Can they imagine what that is like? Can the wealth here in Stellenbosch imagine what it is like to live in poverty with no running water, with people who want to ev evict you from the land? Can you imagine what's that like? So empathy is not so easy to practice because we almost have to overcome ourselves in the process. Difficult, difficult to do. The wonderful thing is if you begin to recognize the pervasiveness of the work of locusts, you can spot the locusts everywhere. You can spot the slow-moving locusts, and you can spot the fast-moving locusts. And you can be responsive to those Dominant leadership is always reactive 
and almost never responsive. To be reactive means you've been kind of slapped in the face and now you have a knee-jerk reaction. You haven't thought things through. You typically do not have a lot of conversation partners. It's just you acting on a gut instinct. To be responsive is to see the challenge coming. So I had the privilege for many years, I worked with persons in Michigan who had uh, early onset Alzheimer's. So they were men and women, typically in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they got the diagnosis of the slow-moving locust. The Alzheimer's will get to them some, sometime. So because we can see it coming, I've had conversations in multiple churches with the elderly a question such as, how would you know that it is time for you to hang up your car keys? How would you know that? It's far on the horizon. It's purely hypothetical because they're all driving it. But there will come a time when they should not be driving anymore. How would they know that? How would they know? that now is the time that I cannot live on my own anymore. But I have to move into a care facility or invite care in. How would you know that's the time now? When we practice awareness, ministry opportunities with all ages just open up. The amazing thing that I've experienced is that nobody resists those conversations very much. Why? Because we know it takes enormous amounts of spiritual and other energies not to feel the pain. So we keep it frozen, rock solid, hard. It's there in the recesses of our gut so that we don't have to feel what's going on. I'm inviting you through awareness to thaw what has been frozen. How can we do that? How can we do that well? Gathering. That is the second act of Joel. Joel says, the response to the locust is you call a sacred assembly. You gather. <laughs> Powell and others have figured out that when, when millennials speak about churches in positive ways, gathering and being hospitable, and they call it the warmth cluster, Practicing warmth is key to that congregation. Just out loud, if you can imagine, how does a congregation practice warmth? How do you do that? Coffee? Tea, coffee? Definitely. Maybe wine. What else? Yeah. Greeting each other when you come in, certainly. Communion spaces. Communion spaces, certainly. Ultimately, warmth is relational. And if you do not have the capacity to enter into relationships, warmth will never be experienced. To enter into relationship means you have to have conversation. That's sometimes difficult with millennials because they prefer to text you rather than having the face-to-face -face conversation. But over the years, I've grown to say, you know, actually, that, that's okay. If it only stays at texting, well, that's probably not so good. But if we have to text for a while before we can have a face-to-face -face conversation, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay. Warmth is really, really key. I think you'll enjoy Powell's book if you read that. The second practice that we can do all the time. Yeah. I'm sorry that you're making me curious. Yeah. Um, I want to, to hear what your perspective is on why do they text and not call. And uh, the other thing that's yeah. very, very strange to me, and I'm sure it's not only me, what they do now 
Ja. Ja. So there are many reasons. There are many reasons. Let me give you one. Just one, okay? If you text or if you record, you can absolutely curate what you communicate. So I can text, and if I don't like it, I just delete and I start new. I can record, and if I don't like what it is, I just delete and I start new. So I can curate and present myself as best as possible. Why? Because I want to be liked. I can present myself as carefully as possible to you. If I do that in real time, we all know real-time conversations can go wrong. It's just challenging. But then even more so, we do know that uh, uh, technology has had a huge impact. So this is, well, uh, maybe I'll get there in a bit. But just to say that technology can function like a human face. And maybe our brains do not always make a distinction whether it's a human face or a screen that is lit up. But good, good, good question. Okay, I want to move on to practicing empowerment and participation. Remember we said that if there's one trait that the millennial folk bring is that they don't believe in hierarchy. If you do, they will subvert your hierarchy over and over again. This is how I see it in my building. The professors who are the strictest in terms of class attendance, being on time, handing in on time, things like that, they have the toughest time to get students to actually do that. Because these professors feel it's disrespect <coughs> if you walk in 10 minutes late. They have all kinds of rules and regulations in their syllabi. Now what I would do is, if you walk in three times late in my class, I will probably have a conversation with you about that. But it's not written in my syllabus that you are penalized because you walked in late for that reason. But collaborative leadership is really, really key. Almost by default, churches cannot practice this because they don't have millennials in their leadership. Again, our models do not help us much. We think that to be the elder, you have to be the oldest. And you cannot be an elder at 24 or 21 or 22. We think there's something that needs to happen first. I don't know if that's actually true. If, if my argument is correct uh, with um, Schreiber and a bunch of others, Drescher, that maybe, maybe the millennial folk are more priestly than we are Maybe we should bring them in earlier even yet so that they can partake in the conversation. So let me ask you this. If we can help the church to absolutely embrace participatory leadership, how do you think the church will change? Just that one act. How will it change if young people have a say in what's happening in a church? Yeah, please. No, no, not to brag. It was actually just a, a lazy act. Uh, we, uh, there was this, this young girl in our church in grade 9. We asked her to, to, to select the music. And everything changed. In what ways? Well, the, the, the people, um, more young people came. Mm -hmm. There were more wolves. There were definitely more... Um, Mysticism, mm -hmm. worship songs, mm -hmm. deepness. Mm -hmm. She, she, uh, I was, I was blown away by this girl, and, she, and she's doing it every Sunday. She will. This is what we will sing this Sunday. We will sing it. Wow. So I imagine you also meet with her and share that this is the content of my sermon, and here's the theme that we are addressing in worship. So, <laughs> so that what she brings can
can be more fully integrated. It's more like a short text message. I hear you. Okay, I, 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 I hear you. But what else? How would churches change if there's more participation from the younger generation? What would you say? I think there will be a better understanding of of and about tradition. Um, I think some of the people in the doesn't know where everything came from, what is the meaning of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We still need the basics. We still need our foundation because we can't do it without it. Um, but we bring in our mm-hmm. as the as the years go and as things improve, we bring in our thing. But the basics are there, the foundation are there. Yeah, and to invite people into the journey, as we as we heard, there's a movement in churches in the U.S. where there's more than one pastor where they took away the senior pastor position and they say we are just co-pastors. Because if you want to break down hierarchy, but your church is the senior and the junior and then the youth. Youth is always the last person. Yes? You too? Yeah. If you do that, then you actually communicate hierarchy all along despite what you want to say on any other level. And because of authenticity, young people recognize that. So, for instance, in many U.S. churches where the senior pastor is always male, the associate pastor is almost always female, the moment you become co-pastors, it does something with gender in the church, which is really important. But then if you are co-pastors, you cannot earn twice what I earn. We have to earn the same. But that is all practices that churches can absolutely uh, sort of uh, engage in. Um, just a question. Yeah. Do you think millennials want to um, be part of the structures of the church? If, won't they just come, for, come two times and then be irritated by the way things are done? I think they'll probably be very frustrated. I can imagine that. But if your relational strength, me to you for instance, is stronger than the frustration you feel, you'll stay. If we do not have a relationship deep enough, why would you stay? So I agree with you. But that is, I think, part of the accountability, isn't it? That we can ask the accountability question is, If we say we do collaborative leadership, are we really doing that? Where do we frustrate that? And remember, systems resist change. So we can imagine that there will be some kind of a frustration. John Perrin is another author that I would like to introduce yourself. Because I like the, 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 the image of the tsunami. The tsunami is also the, the sort of the slow rising. Uh, it comes from deep in the sea and is rushing to land and it overcomes us. Um, but he, he argues for a few things, and I gave you them there, authenticity, aim, uh, alignment, action, and availability. Um, but again, uh, in John Perrin's world, and I totally agree with him, that if we want to minister with millennials, we have to find a way not only to join them, but we have to ask them to become part of our leadership and help us change. Because they are change agents, they would love to do that. I do not imagine a ton of resistance there. To me, this is uh, the, probably the most uh, important uh, uh, sort of practice that we can engage in. To practice mirroring. One of my favorite texts in all of Scripture is the one that I gave there, number six. God is an in-your-face God. It's the only God we have. An in-your-face God. So this is why face is so crucial. God made you and me 
with mirror neurons. A mirror neuron is a receptor in the brain that looks for visual cues of somebody else's face. We know that a baby cannot smile by him or herself alone. For the first few months, a baby smiles when you and I smile. And the mirror neurons kick in. I smile, baby smiles. We know that the mirror neurons do not discriminate. If I have a sad, angry, frustrated face, the baby will mirror my face. The mirror neurons have two amazing qualities. The first one is that um, oxytocin is released. Oxytocin in the brain gives us a sense of closeness or belonging. Without looking each other in the eye, it's near impossible to experience closeness or a sense of belonging. So as I've been talking here up a storm this morning already, and I've been looking many of you in the eye, oxytocin released in my brain, oxytocin released in your brain, and even though we don't know each other well, we have a feeling of closeness. I feel I know you, which I don't. You feel you know me, which you don't. So that's the one thing that happens, oxytocin. The second thing that is released in our brains is basically natural opioids. And as we look each other in the eye, we feel less anxious. We relax. So if you are an anxious preacher, the first thing you want to do before you stand up in people, before people is you want to look as many of them as you can in the eye. And your brain naturally will help you calm down as opioids are being released. Now, to come back to our question, why do people text? This is how God made us. That if I look at a screen, guess what happens? First thing that happens is my mirror neurons are activated. Second thing that happens is oxytocin is being released. I feel close to my thousand followers on Twitter. Because that's what oxytocin does. It gives a sense of closeness. And I feel more relaxed. For all of us in this room, we have had moments where you, you felt the buzz in your pocket and then you take out your phone and nothing hasn't happened. Our bodies has become so comfortable with getting that fix to look that the average person in the U.S. today look at his or her phone 150 times. If you want to live the good life, try looking at your phone 150 times. It's not going to work well. But... Mirroring is key because when I look somebody in the eye, all of these neurochemical processes in our brains kick in. And why would they come back even if they are frustrated? It's because we have looked each other in the eye, which you cannot do from a long distance. It means you probably have to invite people for lunches. You have to invite them for coffees. You have to get to know them. And the conversation will not be on church and coming to church. It will be, what are you doing in the world and how can we join you? That will be the nature of the conversation. Mirroring is really key. To mirror the compassionate God is at the foundation of who we are probably the most important. Can people look at us and in more traditional language see the face of Jesus? Can they look at us and see the face of Jesus? What we also do is we practice invitation. 
invitation can come in so many ways. One of the ways how I practice it is that I draft my syllabus and then two weeks before class I email my syllabus to all the students in the class and I say I think this is going to be a good class what do you think what needs to change what don't you like what can shift there's always people who tell me there's too much reading and I always adjust because if they tell me they are not going to do all that reading anyway what do I gain by telling so I'm just more selective in my reading but I will listen to things like you know you've asked for a paper due before spring break can we do it after spring break and then we have more time to work on it things like that but by inviting people in to co-construct something uh, it opens up possibilities. The invitation, though, is even more important if we ask persons to tell us about your journey with God. And we create the space where people can tell about their travel with God. If Ammerman and others are correct that millennials are deeply spiritual, there are very few millennials who won't be able to answer that question. Who do not have a journey and a conversation with God. Discover. Lots of inviting questions we can ask. Questions that take people on a journey of, of sorts. The fourth act of Joel is to receive the Spirit. One of the concepts that, well actually two concepts because they go kind of hand in hand, but two concepts that has been intriguing me more and more is heartfulness and open-heartedness. They go hand in hand. Open-heartedness is basically this ability that you can communicate warmth to the other person. I'm part of a study project in the US where we look at the warmth a physician communicates to a patient. And what we are discovering is that when a physician communicates warmth the person heals faster. Something happens between the physician and the other person. You cannot be open-hearted and be top-down because part of open-heartedness is about mutuality. So we say to physicians, you walk in and you sit down. Even if you have only a few minutes, which they typically have, you sit down. You don't stand up and talk down to the person. That's not open-heartedness. Heartfulness is actually sort of this beautiful concept. Um, and how I, how I see it for myself is that your heart is big enough to be filled with people who does not look like me, think like me, act like me. Can my heart be open enough to do that? And those concepts are just really, really key. The reason why it's important for you and me to practice open-heartedness and heartfulness is that millennials are folk who absolutely value authenticity. And if you hide behind hierarchy, if you hide behind knowledge, if you hide behind expertise, None of that communicates authenticity and mutuality. So that's the one. The second one for me is equally important. And I mentioned it briefly earlier. Dominant leadership casts visions. Churches love them. Because I will come in and I will tell the church where we will be five years from now and how we're going to get there and I will make it happen. 
dominant leadership, casting visions. I left the Reformed Church in America a couple of years back and joined the Presbyterian Church. The Reformed Church in America at the classes, which is the ring, at the classes level, now appoints vision casters for the whole classes that everybody has to follow. There's one classes in Denver where the vision caster said a congregation that doesn't grow by 5% per year is not worth being a congregation. The mother church of Denver was closed down because she didn't grow fast enough. The fact that she had an amazing presence in an artist community who did not come to church. The vision caster couldn't see the value in that. If we believe that the Spirit of God is on all people, young people too, your task and my task is where can we catch the Spirit that's already there? It's extremely difficult, but so freeing. Because it means you don't have to create anything. You don't have to make it happen. It's already there. <coughs> and you can trust God in that. To catch visions would be very dangerous, though. Because catching the vision of a millennial almost always takes you into new territory. It's not the same old that you're going to find. How can you do that well? Be accountable. And practice accountability. So remember I said that we can reframe the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the day where everybody will come before the living God. We can reframe that by saying there will be a day of accountability and everybody will have to answer to the choices they've made the actions they've taken. So practice accountability. One way how a church can practice accountability is to be more transparent with your money. Millennials almost categorically in the US are the lowest uh, earners. They have the least savings of any generation. And in terms of their parental generations, they are way behind financial security. Churches have to be transparent with their money, which is difficult. Churches like mine, I go to Second Presbyterian in Nashville, we decided a while ago that 20% of the budget will flow back to the community. When the average church in my town is probably 3%, maybe 5%. All the money goes to salaries, upkeep of buildings, and maybe assessments. So if you are transparent with your money, your money should begin to reflect your values. What are the values that you have? Christo? No, no. Mm. And the issue is this, it's not about necessarily about trust in the system, but it has to do with the way that the, that the system comes down. Yeah. The, the, sort of the position from top down. And uh, I would like to ask you about the importance of trust. Yeah, so thank you. I think it's key in our, in our congregations as well. As, as, as young people don't trust, they just don't trust the system. They just don't, don't trust individuals. No, they don't. They don't Exactly. 
closer to human being and you actually understand the image. Exactly, exactly. So I can give you an example of my equivalent experience of the fees must fall out of my university. So at Vanderbilt, we had a building that was called the Confederate Building. And it was donated by the daughters of the Confederacy. So these are people who will say slavery is a good thing. That's what the daughters of the Confederacy believed in. And so the students came and said, and it was a dormitory. We don't want to live in Confederate Hall anymore. So the university went to the Daughters of the Confederacy and said, uh, we, will, we want to ask permission to change the name. The daughter said no. The university came back and said, you gave us a million dollars some time ago to build this residence hall. I'll give you back the million dollars. The Daughters of the Confederacy said, nope, we don't want back our million bucks. And so the initial stance that the university did was trying to do the hierarchy top down. They literally came at night and repainted the name on the building so that when people woke up the next morning, there's no Confederate Hall. Nothing has changed, but the name has been painted over. Then they tried to say to the students, um, we have to learn from history. And we are going to create courses and classes where we again look at the, the Civil War. We are again going to look at slavery and the history thereof. And, and that was the response. And the students said, but what are we going to learn that we do not know already? You know? And so the trust just broke down. Our students started marching. And so finally, the university came to its senses, recognized that a hierarchical, authoritarian answer is not going to work. And what they did was they paid back the Daughters of the Confederacy five million dollars and said, you gave us a million with inflation, that's now five million, here's your five million. And they changed the name to, oh, they changed the name to something positive. It's like, I want to say it's Unity Hall or something like that. But they changed the name to something positive. But people will not trust us, Christo, if we do not show by our actions that something is changing. My system tried to bring change cosmetically. We just paint it over. And then they tried to bring change by saying, we will sort of scoot around the issue by trying to do something else. It did not work, and it does not work. So how do we build trust? We recognize that trust is always built or demolished, but never a given. So why should there be trust if nothing has happened, nothing has been built? So we build trust by listening to each other's stories. So I, t I ask a student, tell me about loss and grief in your life. And I say, you know, this is how I know loss. And it has changed me too in a pretty profound kind of way. That's how we build trust. Hierarchical powers, though, almost always fall back on uh, the power relation, control, and think that that's the way forward. It never, ever works. So how do we do that? Relationally. There's no other way that I know how to build trust other than entering into relationships. Accountability, you get the sense. Accountability in the millennial world is holistic. It's not just one thing. So there's multiple areas that we have to be uh, accountable to. Practice paradox. Paradox is this amazing dynamic that two things that seemingly cannot go together, actually go together. And there's a tension that we cannot solve. Us as Christians should be able to hold paradox easily because we believe in Jesus who was fully human yet fully divine. A big paradox we cannot solve. But sadly, 
we in the Christian church are very poor at paradox. And we like to solve paradox. We don't like the tension paradox brings. So the biggest paradox that I bring with the millennial narrative is that the entry point into the good life is through loss. Seemingly they don't go together. But then, as I've said, we've got lots of other paradoxes that we have to hold as well. The last one that I would like to offer for us is practice forms of restoration. This is the gift that God gives us through the message of Joel. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. God saying, never again will my people be ashamed. And then as the narrative ends with water flowing from God's throne, it takes us to two practices. The one is participation. Now, in the Reformed world, there's an awful lot that has been written about participation. And you can Google some of that. Participation literally means, can I discover what God is doing in this world and join that enterprise? Sometimes what God is doing, God is doing that through other people that I yet have to meet. I've discovered that when I started this nonprofit to help people with autism and Down syndrome, and I soon recognized that I need an awful lot of other people to pull this off. I cannot do this by myself. Or I think I can, but I really can't. Participation, what is God doing already? Can I be a part of that? Generativity is something else. To practice generativity, uh, Eric Erickson, the psychologist, would say, is the task of persons who are in their uh, late 40s, 50s, and 60s, is to practice generativity. Generativity uh, is not asking what is happening and how can I join. Generativity is literally how can I contribute to the world? How can I make this world a different place? For Eric Erickson, generativity is literally, how can I help the youngest generation to flourish? What needs to happen? We had a conversation just a while back here uh, during a break on education and how a lot of people in South Africa need good education. How can we give people education if that's what they need to absolutely flourish? That's the conversation. Restoration is the gift that God bestows on us. And it's actually uh, so freeing to think that God's water just flows through us. I don't have to create the water. I don't have to do anything with it. I just have to be the conduit, basically, and say, flow, flow through me. As we live in a dry part of the world, that is an important image, that water keeps on flowing. Now, one of the questions that I tried to tackle, and we're getting towards the end, one of the questions that I tackle is, so what about Jesus now? Because in the world that you live and I live, um, Jesus is probably seen as the way in. And it's the Jesus story that brings us in. It is the good news that's more important than the good life. Gabe Lyons is a great guy. He lives all of about 10 miles from where I live. And uh, 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 he's got a Christological understanding of how we should save the church. And so as you could hear from me, being tied to Joel, that's not quite uh, where, where I land. I believe in the disclosive power of Scripture, which means if you and I engage the biblical narrative in its entirety, 
that narrative, Scripture unfo uh, un uh, unfolds or discloses a truth for us that we can live into. Personally, I'm not very anxious about inviting people into the story of Joel because I think they will discover Jesus along the way. I actually have quite confidence that that's going to happen. Why? Because we have an inspired text. We have an inspired text. So, so even though there's very little Jesus in my, um, in, in, in my understanding of how do we reach the millennial generation, there's ample room for Jesus in many, many other ways as well. And so the millennial narrative, as we sort of close here, is actually pretty simple. The millennial narrative says, find a way to grieve and mourn your losses, build community, discover the compassionate God, nurture your spirituality, be accountable, and make a difference in the world. If you and I live this way, this world will look differently. As we invite other people to discover the narrative of Joel, they will discover the good life.